It's probably not fun. But thanks for joining. August 22nd. And we're going to talk about some interesting things regarding the latest news. Some of you have asked me to talk about this. They're going to tax unrealized gains. Ah! It's so entertaining. All right, before we get into there, I got to mention aceofcoins.club. There's video series for lots of subjects. Um, several people over the last couple of weeks asked me for help on debt collection cases. These are clients that I've already sealed off your debt collection problem. Yeah, they can sue you and all this, but they can't get anything as long as you do what I showed you. Uh, I'm more than happy to fight a case. You know, it's kind of an ego thing, but I just can't do it. So I have the video series. Buy that, watch it, learn it. I have documents in there. If there's something that's missing, if you think it's not all there, let me know. I'll jump on it. I'll get you something. I think it's all there. You know, it's it's just there's a learning curve. So try it. Aceofcoins.club. I still have the appointments. You can put your time on on my calendar and and talk with me individually. Uh, that's at aceofcoins.com. Uh, now, so so before we get into that, uh, today I just got word from a client. Uh, we took him on a couple of months ago, maybe, and he was in a divorce proceeding, and it was it was ended. You know, it's your typical divorce proceeding. It was ended, and I think the former wife is wanting to cause problems, and I think she's doing this on an ongoing basis. Uh, I don't know, but uh, it turned out where the state of Texas had been sending this gentleman notices uh, telling him that he needs health insurance for his children. Now, first of all, think about it. Does health insurance guarantee that your children are going to be cared for? <laughs> I mean, just doing that, right? Why don't they just instead get a court order that requires him to take care of his children? <gasps> oh, because he's already doing that. <laughs> And who knows, maybe he's got, he's rich, he has friends, he has lots of credit, he can take care of them. He doesn't need insurance, maybe he's self-insured. What business is it of the state of Texas, right? Because the state can't come in there and, and talk about your children unless there's evidence of abuse or neglect. And it starts with not just evidence, it starts with allegations, right? So the state goes in there and alleges that he's, he's doing these horrific things, okay? And then it alleges that it wants to seek discovery regarding these horrific things. So we filed a motion to dismiss and said, well, you're, you're contradicting yourself. First, you say that all these allegations, they must be true. And then you're saying you need information to support these allegations. So which is it? Do you have the information or not? And if you have it, you should make the allegations and then you should be asking for discovery and so forth. And then of course, the, the way the pleading was written, it was kind of generic, you know, like a boilerplate I think they do this. I think they're kind of fishing for a case, you know? They just keep pushing this stuff, right? So we put together a two-page motion to dismiss. We basically looked at the pleading itself and criticized it. Because in a motion to dismiss, you're admitting every, each and every allegation that's properly pled, okay? That's properly stated. So we did that. So we admitted everything, okay? And then we said the argument was this. And so, so what? That was our argument. So he goes to the hearing, the state attorney, the, remember, this is the state of Texas, the state attorney, this is a police power. This is not some, you know, some lawyer at a private law firm. This is the police. So he got it. Anyways, it was, it was almost like a criminal matter. It's like a traffic ticket. Think of it like that. Okay. So before he even gets into the hearing, uh, the attorney for the state of Texas pulls him aside and, and says, Hey, look, we're just going to dismiss this case uh, as a non-suit. He didn't know what that meant, but he said, um, okay. <laughs> and they said, you, you can just go home now, which he did. And he, then he let me know. So that just to give an example. So that's, this is just an example of what you can do. And, and this, there's no magic here. All we did was read the pleading and analyze. Does it make sense? Where, where are you coming from? Where do you get the authority to tell me that I need health insurance with my for my children when you don't even know if I have it? They didn't even know if he had it. They're just saying he need to have it and we need discovery of his financial information to decide whether or not he needs to have it, you know? <laughs> so just that alone, did I need to go to law school to understand that? No, I just need to read it and think to myself, what business is it of the state of Texas to get involved in this guy's life? And really what, what they were trying to do is take child, take his children because the penalty mm -hmm. for whatever they were gonna, the path that they were following is to take his children, as you guys know. Mm -hmm. So this was child custody and the state was trying to take his children and we beat him with a two page document and we beat him so squarely that they wouldn't, they were embarrassed. They didn't even want to let the judge hear it. Cause what are they going to say? 
And, and what's interesting is uh, the state didn't even file a response. So the state really conceded the motion mm -hmm. without opposition. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's nothing fancy. It's just reading, thinking about it. Think about this. Here's the central argument. If I have the liability for something, let's say I have all the liability for something. What business is it of anyone else's to tell me what to do to how to do a thing or finish it up? Or It's none of your business, right? Because it's all on me to get it done. So if I'm taking care of my children and there's no, you know, yeah, I'm not beating them and stuff like that. And there's no evidence of it. And the state comes along, a corporation, an insane person, okay, a creature without a conscience comes along mm -hmm. and says, we think you should do this. Okay, well, you do, huh? So when's the last time you tuck my children in the bed? When's the last time you wipe their ass? When's the last time you clean up the throw up? When's the last time you stay up all night with the mother crying? You don't know why they're crying. The doctor said, just stay with them, right? You didn't do any of that. So you have no business telling me what to do, right? So it, you start at the beginning. What is your standing? And mm -hmm. that's what you do. So I just want to share that with you guys. I'm not going to show you the documents. It's not necessary. You guys get the idea. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, okay. On to the, um, I think this is the fun part. And I'm going to do a screen share here. Remember, I'm sort of, I'm sort of a geek, okay, from way back. <clears throat> I'm not a math person. I like math. I'm not a math person. I like computer programming. Uh, but the codes I know now are outdated. And <laughs> nobody cares. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I, I come from this background, right? So I'm looking at this, this news about this unrealized gain. And I'm thinking, well, isn't a gain profits and aren't profits realized meaning i actually took them meaning i can buy a car with them right if i have a value change in my holdings whatever they are stock real estate whatever if the price goes up do i need to pay tax on that usually not a corporation might because it's involved in accrual based accounting so there's a different type there's different sets of accounting practices there's accrual based where the corporations report gains based on valuation changes. And it's beneficial to the corporation to do that because typically they're mid-level and they have huge deductions. It's very beneficial. But for this, the people like us, just buying cryptos and holding on to it, right? Or having a small business, cash basis is the way to go, all right? For most people, if you choose one and follow it, then you're stuck with that. So if you report unrealized gains, it's going to be taxable because you report it that way. So anyways, what I want to explain was that Taxation is a step function. This is the math term. It's a step function. So think about it. It's not realistic to tax something on a real-time basis. It's not cost-effective. You have to do it on a periodic basis, okay? Intervals and intervals, just like postage stamps, right? The postage stamp goes up by so many cents every once in a while. And it's it's a it just it's graduated, okay? So let me just show you what a step function looks like. Now I'll just, I'm gonna read you the definition because I got this out of Wikipedia and I just kind of reworded a little bit. Um, but a step function, it's a domain or an interval. It's interval-based constant function. So it's a function, right? Uh, it has only uh, so many pieces, all right? That's how it works. So taxes are a step function because you cannot impose taxes on a real-time basis. The only technology we have that can do that now to impose a tax in a real-time basis is what? Anybody want to take a guess at that one? We actually do have the technology to do that. It's kind well, of serious. Would it be on our phones? Close. Like if you buy things through credit cards and stuff? Close. It's the blockchain technology, mm. cryptography, which is a military munition of the US military. Mm -hmm. Cryptography can be used on the blockchain to uh, realistically impose and collect a tax on a real-time basis. And it can also tax devices and it can tax them for anything. It doesn't have to tax them for money. It can tax them for all kinds of things. So anyways, but we, we have the technology that can tax in real time. So that's not being used right now. But so here's, here's the argument that I make. Imagine a grocery store being taxed on the price of price, the price changes of commodities. Now think about the grocery store. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Look at all the cake mixes and everything on the, on the shelves, right? These mm -hmm. come from commodities, wheat and sugar and whatnot commodities for all the products it has on the shelf and then on a real-time basis. So that would be nuts. The, the store would be so volatile, it couldn't even function. It couldn't even be in business, right? Mm -hmm. That would be a tax on an unrealized gain if there was such a thing. But there can't be such a thing because you cannot possibly have an unrealized gain. Now, there was a case recently, if you look it up, 
someone brought a case into the, um, let me just get, let me just show you, uh, do a screenshot real quick, just to show you. I'm going to show you the technical. I always show you everything if I can. I'm going to show you the technical aspects of a step function. This governs your entire system of taxation. You're not going to get this from your accountant. There's your step function. That's the definition. F sub X is a function, the summation function, okay? And these variables mean different things, as you can see here. I'm not going to get into it, but I just thought you'd find that interesting. <laughs> so, enough of that. <laughs> is that okay? Did anybody pass out? All right. No, so, I'll just giggle to death. Well, what? <laughs> I'll just giggle to death. <laughs> All right, so I went, I just found, now I've done so many articles and videos on this for forever, uh, but I did a fresh one, new one, and I went and found an IRS article, I guess it's from the IRS, it's called IRS Tax Tip, you can look this up, Tax Tip 2003-29, and here's what the IRS says, a quote, paper loss, which is what we're talking about here, let's say cryptos, right? If the valuation of your cryptos comes down and you have a Coinbase account, and so the dollar value of your coins goes down, this is what they're talking about. That's a paper loss, but not really. There's no loss until you dispose of the asset, okay? The property. So a paper loss, a drop in an investment's value below its purchase price does not qualify for a deduction. Oh, isn't that sweet? Think about this. Think about it. So if it doesn't qualify for an, a deduction, and then the IRS goes on to say, the loss must be realized through the capital asset sale or exchange. And this is where people have a problem. They think exchange means Coinbase exchange. No, 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 mm. no. The IRS means, the word exchange here means disposition of the asset. You have to go look this up. So mm -hmm. sale or exchange means sale. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you cannot qualify for a tax deduction for an unrealized loss, how can you be taxed for an unrealized gain? Right. If we disregard the obvious self-contradicting phrase, which is an oxymoron, by the way. So all this junk in the news is junk in the news. Stop watching it. Think for yourself. You see how I did that? Go look. That You can't get a deduction on an unrealized loss. What would happen if they say unrealized gain? You know what they're going to have to do to the tax code? It's unconscionable. They, they can't even revise the damn tax code, probably. They'd have to scrap it. It's, you know, the whole tax code is based on this. Anyways, it's just to scare people. Don't be scared. Anyways, the lawsuit has to, is, the citation is more versus United States. I believe this was where, okay, so this is the, the 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 rhetoric on this is that some more sued the United States to preempt Congress from imposing this tax on unrealized gains. And he's saying it's not constitutional, which why do people do that? Okay, fine. That's what he was doing. And the court, the court says, um, we're just going to rule on the other question. We're not going to rule on that one. <laughs> you know why my thinking is, I think that there's no such thing as unrealized gain. And they understand that. How can they make a ruling on something that's not yet defined? How can you define an oxymoron to mean anything? It's self-contradictory. You look like a fool. They're not going to do it. They could come up with another term. Okay, here's, here, and they did. Let, let me show you. This doesn't apply to us. Doesn't apply to cryptos. Don't get scared. But this illustrates what the government can do and what it should do. The government can tax US citizens' interest. Like if you have a corporation, it's the U.S. corporation or your personal individual interest, your interest in a foreign company's shares, you know, a stock interest, you know, an equitable interest in a foreign company uh, without you taking profits, like taking the money, selling the shares or something or taking a dividend. Because what they do is it's like with the uh, the larger corporations, the mid-level and the C-corps that use an, um, accrual-based accounting. There's a, let's call it a forced um, accounting period where you have to close the books as of a certain date, like whatever your company's uh, date is, like usually it's December 31st, sometimes it's April 30th, I don't know, right? So at that date, uh, it's considered, a, there's a disposition on those types of uh, assets. Well, we don't have, we're not in that, we're not doing that. And the cryptos are not, it has nothing to do with a mandatory repatriation tax is what I'm talking about, okay? So more versus United States, 
was uh, decided on this one question of the mandatory repatriation tax. And the government says, yeah, it's, they, they can do that. And that's perfectly within the constitution. Uh, but as far as the uh, unrealized gain <laughs> phrase, they wouldn't rule on it. So then we go on to, let's, look, let's ask the IRS what it thinks about this, all right? So we go to page 16 of the IRS publication 544. Now, if you read this whole publication, it's very informative. You guys should read it. I mean, if you're so in interested in this, it's really important. Um, they talk about non-taxable exchanges, right? Certain exchanges of property are not taxable. Okay, so that's an interesting comment. That comes right from the IRS. So mm -hmm. if someone's telling you, well, it's an exchange. Okay, well, it's not always taxable. So says the IRS. Stop right there. You see, it's that simple. This is what the IRS said. You can quote it. According to the IRS, on page 16 of its publication 544, it says certain exchanges of property are not taxable. What's What did the IRS define crypto coins as? Property. Property. Thank you. So how can you ever even have an argument with anybody? Let's not argue with ourselves. Let's just go ask the IRS what it thinks. Oh, it told us right here. <laughs> this means any gain from an, the exchange is not recognized and any loss cannot be deducted. Your gain or loss will not be recognized until you sell or otherwise dispose of the property you receive. Those are my words. Anyways, mm -mm -mm. wait a minute. No, I'm sorry. That is the IRS saying that. And what's the name, the number of that publication again? 544. 544. Look on page 16, non-taxable exchanges. And you'll see there's more and more of this. I just want to give you a brief, just to see what, and by the way, I put this together, these notes in about 15 minutes. Now that doesn't mean I'm some kind of genius. It just means this is how simple this is. And thanks to the internet, mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to use the AI, you could do that too. I didn't, I didn't do that, but I, I should. But uh, anyway, so crypto exchanges are not exchanging crypto coins. See, that's the other thing. Mm -hmm. Let's say I'm wrong, right? What's going on with the exchanges? That you're, you're buying coins from them, but you're actually not. You're giving them money and then the exchange holds the coins for you in trust. So the, so the exchange is the owner of the private key. That creates a trust relationship. Now, I'm not saying the trust creates a non-taxable situation. What I'm saying is that the ownership never changes while you're on the exchange. So what business does the exchange have sending anybody a 1099 who didn't sell his coins? None. Mm -hmm. It should only be for, I mean, I don't care what arguments and stories you want to tell me and software, all the software is wrong. And you know what? I've never even tried to use it before. I can tell you right now, it's all wrong. It's all wrong. So they're not exchanging the coins. Okay. What they're doing is they have like a pointer system. It's like a, uh, what do you call it? Mm, like the computers use. It's a pointer system and they're using an overlay spreadsheet. Okay. So in your account, it looks like you actually bought and sold and whatnot, but not, you didn't. The exchange is holding the ownership completely uniform, uh, you know, seamlessly without uh, interruption. So the term used is not the same as the, so the term exchange is not the same, okay? Crypto mm -hmm. exchange is completely different than the use of the term in the IRS publications. Mm -hmm. All right, anyways. So the value of, okay, so the value of each property is equal. So that's the other thing. At the moment you make the exchange. So here's the difference. So let's say, Let's say I buy a gold coin. Is that taxable? Where's the profit? Right. I just bought some property, right? But let's say I bought I bought the gold coin and then I sold it like a year later. Okay, now I get a, a cost basis, and there's a there's a transaction there. There's a two sides. Of, there's it's a two sided right. There's a beginning and an end. I acquired the property and then I sold it. Oh, now the IRS is interested in that, right? No problem. But when I just buy the coin. Iris doesn't care. <laughs> so it's it's only one. It's only one side of the transaction. You need two actual exchanges to make a taxable record that you can even tax. There's no gain on, on one single uh, exchange. There's only a gain measured when you have two exchanges. So anyways... That is what I wanted to say. Did I say <laughs> Thank you. That's that, cool though. That's the message. I mean, look around at the news. Mm -hmm. I went and mm -hmm. found the case citation, Moore versus US. It's a recent, it's uh, now. They just made a ruling, you know, and look at what all the accounts are, you know, saying. You know, I keep getting emails from people saying, we have this service where 
we'll report your BOI information, you know? I called one guy up today and I said, you know, this is wrong. There is no such obligation. He's, he can, if you want to hear that because he's charging like hundreds of dollars to fill out mm. this, he doesn't have to do, nobody has to do. It's just, it's wrong. So it really comes down to us, what we do. We really have to be, you know, diligent and look at this stuff. Think about it. Mm -hmm. So. Hey, John. Yeah. Um, when you say if you buy something on Coinbase and that's one exchange and then you keep it there on Coinbase, it's not taxable. That makes sense. But you're saying if you move it to another exchange, let's say you move it to your treasure, that's still not a taxable event in my Correct. mind. Correct. It's not. <laughs> and, and as far as all the rules are concerned, that is not. And this sounds really crude, but um, if here's how it works. If they cannot see it, it cannot be taxed. Right? My dad used to say that. And But it's true. Think about it. Let's say I take uh, $10,000 and I buy Bitcoin on Coinbase. And I bought Bitcoin because I want to buy three or four other coins on Coinbase. So I do that. So now Coinbase has a record of how I've allocated my $10,000. Mm -hmm. That's where the problem comes in, I think. Just mm -hmm. something to think about. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do it this way. But what if instead I just use the facility of Coinbase to move from my bank account to Coinbase to buy the Bitcoin? Now I have Bitcoin in a wallet. Now I know I'm not the private key holder. So I'm really not the owner. But Coinbase will send the money where I tell it. So I tell it to send it to this other wallet. And let's say it's a paper wallet. Actually, this is not functional for what I'm talking about. Let's say it's a wallet where I can actually uh, reallocate the Bitcoin, the $10,000 of Bitcoin, right? So Coinbase sees $10,000 come in, it sells $10,000 worth of Bitcoin, and then it sees that the Bitcoin is, tr is transferred off of its platform onto another platform. It can't track that, but you then can reallocate that 10,000, however you see fit. And Coinbase can't track it. Coinbase can't well, has nothing to say about it. I, I, I believe that it, you can track it. You can track it because you've got your wallet address of record. Yeah, they can go Talk on the about blockchain, white listing gonna, wallets yeah, too now. They're not going to do that though. And it doesn't matter anyways, because there's you're just moving from wallet to wallet. The beneficial interests are uniform throughout the whole process. But I'm just saying, if you were to do that, put onto a BitFi or something or a ledger and reallocate how you like and not do that on the exchange, I think you would avoid a lot of uh, drama with them. Mm -hmm. And use different wallet addresses. Yeah, I mean, I, I always do things uh, with the idea that uh, whatever I'm doing is going to be seen from beginning mm -hmm. to end. I, I, sometimes uh, it's, it's good to have secret transactions. It's useful when I can and when it's necessary. Uh, but for the most part, I just do everything out in the open. And I've even done things for a long period of time where my client went into an audit and the IRS just looked at everything and there was no issue. There was no question. Don't do anything outrageous. So I just want to share that with you guys. And I don't know if you're, you're probably not, probably people on this call are not reacting too much to the news other than to laugh at it. I mean, laugh at how they stage things. Could you explain again? Uh, I mean, if if you take your Bitcoin off of Coinbase, whatever exchange, and you put it on your ledger, don't you now have the private keys? Exactly. You then have the Okay, but right. I thought you said something about that when you move it to a different wallet, they still have the keys, and I didn't understand that well they'll, their software will will uh transfer just like if you were buying something it'll transfer the wallet contents to another wallet you just use the software to do so and that's the nature of the trust see because even though coinbase is the trustee and owns the private keys it owes you those keys that's what makes it the trustee it owes you the keys or it owes you the contents of the wallet so you become the beneficiary as the account holder at coinbase So they're sending it to my ledger. Okay. So I'm the beneficiary. Well, yeah. And that trust collapses once the money goes into your next wallet. Once you're off the Coinbase exchange, now you hold the private keys and there's no trust relationship because it's in your possession now. Okay. Now it's in your possession. Okay. So there's no other party involved. But before then, it was, a, it was a trust relationship. It is a trust. You know, think about it. Coinbase is opening trust accounts for everybody and they hmm. don't 
couldn't understand what's going on. They're all trust accounts. It has to be because of the nature of the coins and the software that's being used to make this work. It used to be that way with the banks. You were the depositor, you were the lender to the bank and they slowly eroded the rules and made it, switched it around. I don't know how they do that anyways, but they, they switched it around up to like 10 years ago. They must've changed some regulations or some accounting practices to make it to where it's their money. When you put money in the bank, the bank says it's theirs. I don't understand that, but. Does that same a uh, hold true if you have an LLC at that bank? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Any account holder. I mean, I think it's just because it, it's an it's a reality. It's a contractual reality. Um, they're not just saying that. They can act that way and the court will uphold it. So I don't know if that's a problem. I mean, maybe it so, is. So that means if you have an LLC at a bank, the bank can still confiscate. Sure. It doesn't care who the account holder is in that sense. It doesn't matter. What you're doing with the LLC at the bank is you're separating your personal liability from the property that you care about. The bank just happens to be the service provider. But you're not you're not immune from what the bank wants to do with the property. It doesn't it doesn't have any uh you know uh bias between account holders, really, in that sense. It's just an account holder. <laughs> So if you want to uh, whip out the uh, the step function equation to show your friends, to make the point that it's a step function, taxing somebody with an unrealized gain, if there was such a thing, would mean that the tax system is no longer relied upon, relies upon a step function. The alternative is tax you in real time. How does that make any sense? It's always going to be a step function. I mean, look at the bus schedule. Do you think there's a bus like every second? No, you get to wait like 30 minutes, right? For the next bus. That's a step function. <laughs> that right there. I mean, you show somebody that. Imagine. I never heard that before. <laughs> what does that all mean? <laughs> Those Greek letters. <laughs> all right. Anything interesting? Referring to Texas, they're chatting about. May I cover it? You may correct. Yeah. Okay. So, is there anything that I, that I missed? Is anybody chatting on something? I don't want to. Not, do not like a straight up question. I mean, uh, people do want to know where this will be posted later. All right. So I will uh, put post this on the internet. This just like it is. I, it's going to be on YouTube, and I'll probably do it shortly. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You guys were nice enough to let me leave early today. I'll answer any questions, but if none, I'm out of here. <laughs> All right. Oh, when's uh, our you... meeting? When's our biometric meeting? Let's let's have a meeting. Um, what do you want to do? A special class or something? Yeah, like how do we put it together? Let's do it. Okay. Well, okay. So I want, I'm going to ask this. It's rhetorical, but any anybody who's done one already, if you're willing to show others how you've done it, I'm all for that, and I'll be on the call. Um, you guys can do a Zoom call or have me do it. Let me know. I'm happy to do it and show you guys. Um, there, I mean, I can. That's the first step. The other part is what you're going to do then after you have it. It's not. It's juvenile to just try to collect eight dollars. Okay, it's better to work with other people and consolidate these claims into mm -hmm. something that can be used for some fun. Yeah, you need a list of creditors to file an involuntary uh, receivership. You can file that in your state court or in the U.S. District Court. I would probably use the U.S. District Court, but we can talk about that. But let okay, me let yeah, me know. that's down the road. But you're just saying like let's yeah. get started with everybody. Like yeah. we'll do Google one day. We'll do we could just yeah. Do, everybody yeah. should do Google. Yeah, that's just one. You should have like thirty or forty by the end of the year. Yeah, but, so we could like come up with a list of people that of of companies that we want to get biometric agreements with. Mm -hmm. and somebody show their letter because i know people have done it and they've done the package okay coop said she's she's got this that she purchased the package and she doesn't know how to implement it perfect so <laughs> so let's uh well let's the, what, you got the biometric security agreement because the contract is there you just have to make sure that it's the debtor you want and that all the terms are correct that they're factually correct then you just record it 
Uh, if I do it for you, I usually give you a cover letter. So yeah. like with TSA, you know, you either have to do your biometric or you have to be raped by them. So it's not a good option. I know. I always choose yeah. to feel it myself, but all right. <laughs> what, what, Mocha? I said, I always choose to feel it myself, but never mind. <laughs> it, it, it's just like bad. It's bad. Yeah, just put a lean on them. I can't, I don't know what to tell you on that one. So many people thought it was a good idea. What are you going to do? You can't overcome the mob. But we can become the mob. Okay, let's get more people to think like we do. I'm all for that's it. What I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Biometric at Walmart, people are saying, uh, I believe I've been to Home Depot and they're like, they get little cameras on their cash registers. Mm -hmm. So, so it would be like these stores. It's not a Everybody legit. wants your eyeball or your palm or your body, or they just want your bot. Any, they want parts of your body. Right. Look, if you guys want to start poking this a little bit, you can you yes. can put liens on the TSA, right? But yeah. why not send a letter to your local grocery store and say that when you were in the bathroom, you watched a few people come in there with their phones and ask that ask that say something like, "I was in my understanding that." taking video cameras in the bathroom is probably not legal. And I'm not comfortable coming in your store anymore where people are allowed to take video cameras and refer to the phone as a video camera, because it is, oh. into the bathroom. And watch what kind of drama you can create. Watch, they're going to start putting notices on the thing and don't bring your camera or whatever, you know. Keep your phone in your pocket. <laughs> uh, something, I don't know what they'll do, but... It's going to create a lot of drama, and it would. It could, you could roll it over to something else. Then what? Because I just think you know if they could be on the defense and we could be on the offense. That's that's a better position. I because... think putting a lean on your data is going to really put you in that position. Okay, so over, yeah. Okay, so I don't know how to do that. So I'm I'm let's do it. All right. Yeah, TSA <laughs> is a good one. In fact, we should probably start it with those guys. But Google's a, an obvious one. Three leaf. What did you want to ask? I'm sorry to make you wait so long. Did did you did you do that? I'm sorry. Oh yeah. Hey, this Thanks. is uh, for a friend. Um, she is uh, getting a 508C1A from oh. for her. What well, is currently a 501C3? So she's okay. adding that uh, mandatory exemption into it. Okay. And uh, the guy that she's getting it from gave her the trust, irrevocable trust. Um, she, but I told her, don't take the whole thing into the bank, you know, get an abstract. And she was listening to you. And she said, you said that there's a two page document on legal zoom for that banking abstract for the trust. Do you recall that? Oh, you can find a sample trust. Sure. You can find a trust agreement. On legal <clears throat> zoom. Yeah. There's so many. Yeah. So it doesn't really have to say anything. It's just kind of like whatever. Well, you a generic have, trust. If you're, if you're opening a trust account, you said a 508. Yeah. Is it a corporation? That's an ink. So which is it? Is it a trust account? It's a uh it's a um it is a trust. It's a uh a faith-based organization trust, ecclesiastical, private so if, trust. Okay, but if it's a 508, that's a corporation with tax exemption. That's not a trust. Yeah, well, it's a 508C1A. That's what it is. It's a ministry or a self-supporting ministry or faith-based organization, but it's excluded. It's under 501C3. Yeah. It's excluded from filing taxes. It's excluded from paying taxes. And uh, I got I opened an account. I just you went did? in there. Yeah, just go in there and uh, tell them what it is. And what they'll do is they'll say, oh, it's a uh, nonprofit. Just go along with it. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> And just well, go that's on. what she's got yeah, now is a nonprofit, but she wants to take in that mandatory exemption so she doesn't have to do all that tedious bookkeeping anymore. Uh, I didn't show them anything. In fact, just like you say, John, I went to the first bank and they're trying to characterize it as a 501c3. They want to see the corporate charter. And I said, look, show this to the legal department. They came yeah. back. He called. I said, screw it. I left. Yeah. And then you know what I did? I went to the big bank, Wells Fargo. Hmm. No, no, I didn't go to West Park. I went to, uh, it was a bigger bank. It was, uh, what the hell was that? Truett. Truist oh. or something like that. Yeah. Mm. And they opened it right up. They didn't ask a question. So the smaller yeah. banks were harder. 
Well, it depends on the employee too, but what's the whole purpose? What does this trust have to do with the 508? I don't know. You're well, asking, I mean, she asked me about a trust document. What does that have to do with the 508? Whoever's a vendor is trying to sell her a trust, apparently. Yeah, what's, the, you have, what's the whole purpose of this anyways? Are you running a church? She, well, it can be an educational. Um, or is she just trying to not pay taxes? Is that what it no, is? No, no, no. It's not. It's not that. It's that she. Um, she's she's had a five hundred one c three for like probably twenty years, and uh, it's based out of California, which is a real pain in the butt. But um, so she wants to get. She wants to be relieved of having all that record keeping and de uh, filings and all that kind of stuff. So it's just then simply. Ray, you might know better, you know, better since you've gone through it, but it's simply, you don't even have to report it, right? Because it's a mandatory exemption that's implied. Yeah. The 501 C three is what controls the churches where they can't be true churches. They're really uh, you know, tax exempt organization we're reporting. They should have been 508 from the start. That's why they have it under 501 C three. Mm. Oh yeah. It goes back to 19. So Lyndon B. Johnson's the one that introduced it into this, introduced it in 56 or 55, 1955, six. And all the churches were then pushed by accountants, which are enrolled agents, into being 501 C3s. Originally they never paid taxes. Yeah. Hell, they used to and they used to talk politics, you know, in the churches, which they won't allow now. They then go right. out after the church and shoot guns out in the back sure. on target practice. Yeah. So it changed everything. <laughs> so a church became permission based instead of a right under the First Amendment with the 501c3 classification. Wow. So a church should change back to a 508c1a and tell the government jump because it's in the Internal Revenue Code. Right. Just like you were talking a minute ago, John, you know, like the code says what it says and it means what yeah. it means. Yeah. It's and, very well uh, thought out. Yeah. Yeah, and so when it says excluded, see, excluded is stronger than exempt. It is excluded. Excluded is much better. That's what I'm yeah. doing. I use LLCs in a way that excludes the tax liability. That's exactly right. Because exempt, you have to qualify for. But if you're if you're uh -huh. thinking, if your friend is thinking, oh, I'm going to avoid all the accounting. Well, that's irresponsible. If you're running a nonprofit, you need accounting. You need to be accountable to your donors. Getting out of just because the government is not asking for your accounting doesn't mean you don't have an accounting obligation. Right, right. You still got to have accounting and minutes. That's the wrong reason. That's the wrong reason to do it, reorganize as a 508. It's the wrong reason. You know, she it doesn't, doesn't really, really she doesn't really get many donations. It's been, you know, like I said, 20 years. It's it's a documentary film company. And uh so yeah, it's more I don't know what why she did it initially. Probably not to pay taxes. Probably. I find that most people do it that way. They're Probably. not even using it for the intended purpose, but they get away with it. It's just, it's really uneducated really to do that. But yeah, you, you could 508. I don't know what the trust, the trust has nothing to do with that. And you could just like Ray said, open your account. Mm -hmm. so just show them what they want to see, the bylaws and whatever. It's a corporation, it's public record. So. Show them as little I as possible. I, the, I know when I did the LLC with the LLCs I did with you, um, you gave me a banking abstract. Yeah, that helps. Hey, don't don't market. show it all to the bank. Yeah, that keeps your operating agreement private easily instead of arguing. Yeah. Yeah. So she was thinking probably like the same thing. Well, it's a public corporation. I mean, it's a public record. The articles are public. What are you going to keep private? I think the 508 is a private. It is private. Uh, but the banks yeah. want to collect all the records. See, the bank is doing the work of the government. It's a repository yeah. for our. I mean, yeah. I find it very confusing and complex, and but I told her I'd listen in and ask for her. So, all right. Well, I hope that helps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, thanks. Ray, for that history. Yeah. I didn't know that that was that's where it came from. Yeah, it's just it's just one sentence. The five hundred eight C one A. Uh huh. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. It's all it is. The formation of a company is simply a declaration. It's a series of words, like mm -hmm. a Harry Potter incantation. <laughs> then you have to follow it that way. Um, somebody's asking about if I would show a motion to dismiss. Okay, I've shown many, many of those and they're in my video series and I go through actual cases and I show you. Um, you can also ask the AI, write you a motion to dismiss and be more specific. Say, what are the legal criteria for a motion to dismiss in the state of Michigan or something, you know? Cite the rule for a motion to dismiss. The AI will do that for you. Can you format it? Ask it for a legal memorandum. What are the grounds for a motion to dismiss? 
why would I file one, right? The AI is very good. It'll tell you. So, but anyways, yeah, my video series has all that in there. All right. Hey, back back to what we were talking about a moment ago. That's that's a big deal. That biometric scanning is security agreements and all because they're pushing it on this UN 2.0. I was reading it, and they're coming out with these central bank digital currencies. They intend to have it where, so these people are coming out from the system and talking about it. They're seeing what they plan to do. So they intend to have biometric scanning to do everything, whether you go to your bank, whether you go on the internet, whether you go shopping. They well, want to I, try scan. To, I try to rent a house and the, you have to go through a, a bio scan with photo and compare with your driver's license. They won't even go there to show you the damn house anymore. They make huh. you, do it, they call it self touring. Like these guys, these people don't even want to show you the house. They don't even want to do what work. They're using, they're making everything through software. And then they're, they're making you give up all your data on some third party platform in order to qualify. It's just crazy. But this is the, I don't know. I try to get around that because I just went to, I just got an agent and I said, I'll do a contract with you. And so she's doing it for me. We have a different strategy, but still, this is the future. They're trying, well, they're trying to make it the future. I don't think it's going to fly. I don't think I mean, it will. No, I mean, even people that are good with the phones and all that. Yeah. If you don't have a phone, they're making it to where you can't even live in society. It's almost getting that way, but mm -hmm. you can get around if you think things through, but it's not going to be so easy, uh, you know, going forward. And, and but I, maybe I, mean, I could be naive, but I just think that, I don't think that's going to work. Oh, hey, here's what the deal is. I said it a long time ago. I mean, hit my thought. Okay, so you know how we've had the invasion with the illegals coming in? 30 mm -hmm. million? It was, you know what the purpose was? Oh, we've got too many illegals. We have to have biometric scanning now. To Okay, that, that, that would make sense. That answers mm -hmm. a lot of my questions. Yeah, that makes sense. That's what it, that's what they're claiming. It was, so it was created, you know, on one hand, you create the problem. Right. Um, that makes total uh, sense. Um, publication 544, somebody was asking me. Oh, yeah, you already said that. Yeah, I know. I just want to. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> so somebody was asking me again, so I. Okay. But, yeah, John, I'm, I'm going to put this whole video on YouTube. I got a, I got a question, John. Yeah. Um, so on the, uh, the biometric security, uh, th there's a part that says survival of rights, um, and where it talks about the uh, survival rights on biometric security data, where it states the rights are assigned to a family trust, which I currently do not have. So I didn't know if there might be any kind of conflict because on the UCC one agreement, there's an area where it talks about on um, five through seven, where it talks about, do we want to put our name there or in, in another entity like a trust? And so I didn't know if there could be a conflict there if I, if the trust is not set up, and then there's a survival of rights scenario where it, the liens get assigned to say beneficiaries and that trust is not set up, even though in the agreement, it says it's not assigned to a family trust. Do you have a family? Right now? Uh, no, I'm single. Okay. But I mean, I, I have family yeah, members. Yes. You have parents and probably yes. siblings and all this. So, I mean, we all have families at some point. I mean, there are some people that are alone, but uh, the fact that you have a family and you're from a family means you have a family and there's a, there's always a trust relationship and it doesn't okay. need to be in writing. You don't need pieces of paper with words on it, right? To have a trust, but just the same, if you want to make, create an entity out of it, you could create a trust instrument to represent the trust relationship. Generally, you could do that in five minutes. So that's why I put that in there. It gives okay. you the, to just go ahead and do that. So you do have a trust and it's nobody's business. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if you need that's, a document, okay, that's, okay. yeah. Okay, yeah, I saw that in the, the agreements, the survival of rights, and it was just like, okay, that's what I was getting a little hung up on. It was just like, do I need to have something conveyed? No, I wanted so to make that's something that will survive for a long time. <laughs> what better way to survive than say, oh, well, it's my family. I mean, my family's still around. You know, when I die, my family will still be around. You know, sometimes they get wiped out, you know, in wars and whatnot, but it's a pretty good bet that your family's going to be around. But a family trust can be anything. Okay. And you can just make it up. Really. It's not It's not cheating. It's not lying. There's no fraud there. You can do it. And that's why I put it in there. So it's you know perpetual. It's going to serve you for forever. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Cool. I want to clear because I didn't know if I would need to like amend it later if I got a trust or something. So that way, like if there is a survival situation where all, where all those agreements that get sent out get assigned to they're getting allocated to properly. Yeah. Um, so, okay, cool. Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, if you want to take it further, you could develop a trust or you can even change that. You can make it an LLC or something. You can make the LLC the trustee. You know, there's all kinds of things you can do. Got it. Cool. Thank you. All right. Yeah, that was a good question. Appreciate that. Where's the biometric at Walmart? I haven't seen that yet. Oh, that's right. When you go check out, right? You see yourself on the video camera. We're watching you. Every store has that. Every single store. Yeah, well, put a lean on them. I'm just tired of complaining about it. You know, I'm like, you guys probably like, oh, they're going to do this to us next. And then finally, I'm like, wait a minute. Wow, I'm wasting my time with this. Just put a lean on it. <laughs> and say, thank you very much. Send them a Christmas card. You're so nice to give me this money. So nice to buy my biometric data from me. <laughs> All right. We can go to lots of subjects, but anyways, uh, I hope we had some fun with that one. I know it's kind of pedantic, but. All right, y'all. Enjoy Thank your weekend. You. It's Thanks, about Sean. To start. Thank you. All good right. call. Thanks a lot. Go lean somebody. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Have a good night.